Um, next, I'd like to welcome John Bailey, um, who is currently the Vice President of Policy at the Foundation for Excellence in Education. He's also the Executive Director of Digital Learning Now, has a wide variety of different um, entrepreneurial and digital activities that he's been involved in. And actually, this is his second trip back to South Carolina. He was here for a summit that we did when my old boss was still in the Senate about five years ago now, which is hard to believe. But we're very excited um, for him to be back in South Carolina and to be part of the conversation that we're having about how we can bring equity, especially in a lot of our rural districts, districts through um, the innovation and technology that digital learning makes available. John Bailey. Great, thanks. And just really want to plug again what's going on in Tennessee with the Achievement School District there is really one of the more cutting edge innovations. Uh, one of the sticky points uh, in all of American education, regardless of what state, South Carolina, any state, is what to do with the struggling schools, so as low as 5%. And uh, it's one of the few success stories that we have sort of out there. So great model to, to take a look at. I am going to just uh, talk a little bit about some digital learning models uh, and some ideas for ways that South Carolina could lead the nation, because uh, there's still lots of opportunity that's just waiting for state leadership to seize it. And so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, about some of those opportunities. So, I mean, there's um, two sort of core drivers, I would say, that's that's generating so much interest in uh, in digital learning and digital learning models. One is just, again, what to do with uh, the challenges in terms of student performance and how do we get uh, a school system, again, a system of schools uh, and a system of education funding that was designed for an industrial era to really help uh, support kids with all the opportunities that are around them now. Uh, with the digital environments uh, that they're growing up in uh, and for the digital world that they're entering. And you know, you've all seen some of the statistics, but again, you have a, a ton of students who think and want to go to college uh, very early on, and then very slowly but surely, uh, they start falling through the cracks through the system. <laughs> just thought it was a whoop cool we're good um, and again very slowly start falling through the system even the kids that make it uh, through our system uh, are confronted with a pretty harsh reality when they get to college that they have to start immediately taking remedial courses uh, and this just is a huge drain uh, on taxpayer dollars when we're talking about the funding system it's so much easier and cheaper to educate a student sooner than later uh, and often that's what we're doing. We're paying higher education prices to give kids a high school level education. We're spending high school level dollars to help kids catch up because they can't, uh, they weren't proficient in reading by the third grade. Uh, in, again, in uh, South Carolina, the statistics really match and mirror what's going on again nationally. You have 100% of ninth graders, uh, only 54 graduate within four years, 38 enroll in college, 24 are still enrolled by their sophomore year, 15 end up with a diploma. We're losing one of our most precious resources as a country and as a state. It's not physical capital now, it's human capital that's driving the economy and really helping to make our states um, the rich democracies that they are. The second is just the world that our kids live in is just radically different from the world that we all grew up in. Uh, and there's a, a task force that Governor Bush was a co-chair of, uh, along with Rosario Dawson, uh, the actress, people sort of known, maybe she's somewhat, yeah, so, so, some people know her. Line is it anyway? What was that? Whose line is it anyway? Is that true? She's the host. Oh, okay, well there you go. So, uh, so she, was, uh, she was our actress and our co-chair, uh, and then we had a whole variety of different uh, public policy makers, three former FCC commissioners, uh, Democrats as well as Republicans. We had a superintendent, a librarian. Uh, we had uh, industry representatives from Google, Facebook, as well as Microsoft, uh, as well as some nonprofits. So real celebrities and sort of in the tech and the digital world asking the questions about what happens when a student is at the center of an education system. If you had to create an education system with a student at the center, what would that look like? And chances are it would look pretty different than the type of system we have now. We're sort of backfilling it into sort of the digital opportunities. And it, it really sort of grew this really rich discussion. I'll only cover a couple of the points. It's a, it's a rich report. It's over 100 pages, but sort of really casts a vision for what a student-centered learning system would look like. Uh, what's so fun about this is that there are a bunch of people who never 
thought about education all of a sudden coming into a room and then thinking about a lot of the forms that we're talking about today. I mean, literally saying, gosh, if we had to design a system for kids, it'd look a lot like the Tennessee Achievement School District. If we had to design a system around kids, it would have a lot more sort of options because frankly, there's a lot of kids exercising options. It's just not recognized in the formal school setting. Uh, we have this sort of phenomena now of kids taking computer co coding courses during the summer uh, with apps. You could just freely download an app and start teaching yourself a foreign language, teach yourself computer programming. So there's uh, this new tension on the system of what happens when students start showing up with their own learning at school, right? Will, will school recognize that that student has actually taught themselves computer programming with an app? Will the system recognize that the student taught themselves French using Duolingo? Or will the system say, that's great, but now you're going to have to take our French course, right? These are sort of huge tensions that are sort of coming out. And again, the, the commission really tackled a lot of this. And the one point that they tackled too, which is something we'll talk about later, is this really precious um, uh, uh, privilege, but also a need to build trust in terms of how student data is used. We all think about that in public policy circles in terms of uh, data security and student data privacy. At the end of the day, though, it comes about trust. And what we're, we're, we're seeing pop up all across the country is a lot of anxiety around what is happening with all these different systems uh, and all these different uses of student data. And for those on the center left, they're very concerned with the private sector having access to that data. For those on the center right, very concerned about levels of government having access to that data. At the end of the day, there's this sort of shared concern about who has access to the data, how's it being used, and how's it being shared? And so we talked a little bit about the trust and environment. All right, we'll take a question. Sure. Let me ask a question about the competency issue. How did they address that? Did they, did they do similar to what they are doing with AP exams and things like that? Where you have a competency test, a recognized competency test, yeah. that you have to meet the certain yeah, standards? No, I think, I mean, you, you hit the, the nail on the head. That's very much what, um, you know, sort of calling for, for school systems and for us in public policy to be able to create opportunities for students to demonstrate that they've mastered that material, whether it was from school, from an app, from another outside provider, and they get credit and be able to sort of move on, uh, including creating more flexible, we're talking a lot about funding today, but creating a lot of flexible funding opportunities for students to be able to help pursue that too. That has a great deal of application in our education. Very much so, yeah. Yes. Uh, to try and address the uh, issue of graduation rates and lowering graduation, or not lowering, but lowering the, the number of years it takes to graduate, and also address some of the uh, issues of uh, cost of higher education. Yeah. You're absolutely right. If you think about, I mean, again, the, the real, I mean, if you want to talk about an economic anxiety for most Americans, it's the cost of higher education, as well as for you and state lawmakers, how to keep paying for it, right? Because this is, this is the one, student loan debt is the only debt that actually went up for American households during the recession. Everything else went down, household, or sorry, uh, um, housing debt, uh, credit card debt, student loans went up. Uh, and, and what Governor Walker and a couple other governors around the, the country are doing right now is saying, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that have on-the-job experience. Uh, they may have taught themselves uh, by using, again, an online course or a free MOOC or something else. And so if you go to the University of Wisconsin, you can actually get credit by just paying a small fee, taking a test, and if you demonstrate that you, you've mastered it, uh, then you get a credit for it. And so it saves the state money, it saves the student a lot of money, and they're able to sort of start taking courses that are sort of m more advanced and more towards the degree that they're going in. That's all experimentation that's happening at the higher education level. You're seeing this at Western Governors University too. We need to bring that in a very rich discussion that's going on, it, bring that into a conversation here in, um, in K-12 as well. John, real quick yeah. on, the, on the yeah. data if I could. So, um, there certainly are new data points that have been created with new online courses and ways of looking at learning, but is it true that a lot of the data that is used to improve instruction has existed for years in paper form or in systems that don't talk to each other? So it's not like this is bringing on a whole bunch of new data that is necessarily had never existed before. It's just now it's actually being useful to drive improvements in instruction. Yeah. No, I think it's true. I mean, it's, you know, when we talk about data in education, uh, it's very true that it used to be very clear cut because there was paper based data. We had, you know, papers, we had student papers, we had grades, we had grade books and report cards. And that's all very true that that all exists in a sort of a digital way now. Uh, but it's also true that there's just a ton of rich other new education data that's out there. You know, a lot of, if you take an online course, uh, a lot, oftentimes it'll track sort of measurement in terms of how long you've been on 
have you skipped a video? How long have you been in a course on our lesson and that sort of thing? And there's questions about how do we harmonize that into what is a student record? And then who has access to it? I think a lot of what we're hearing uh, in terms of, of parents really concerned about student data privacy is because they just don't have access to the records. Right, if you called up your bank and said, I want access to my financial records, they're mandated to give it to you within 24 hours. If you want your health records, mandated three days. Education records, 45 days, right? And then as if the schools can sort of patch it together. So we're sort of having to catch up, I think, in this debate a little bit, but it's, uh, it's anxiety in terms of wanting to have access to see what is being collected on my, my child and how is that being shared and used. But it's, it's a good point that there's a lot of this, it's just sort of resurfacing uh, now uh, because of the fact that it's digital, but a lot of this has been collected and frankly stored in very less secure ways uh, in the past because it was in a teacher's desk, in an unlocked room, you know, and so forth. So South Carolina has a ton of strengths. Like I, I just, uh, you, you are one of the, the few states that have been leading the way, particularly as it relates with online learning. You have a really rich, diverse uh, group of full-time uh, uh, cyber charter schools, virtual schools. Uh, you have the South Carolina Virtual School Program with huge enrollments, big jumps, uh, and some bills that have passed recently to help sort of ex uh, strengthen that program. So lots of strengths. We do an annual uh, digital learning report card, uh, and South Carolina has, uh, has always earned a B, a B uh, somewhere in the B category, so B and B minus. So very strong compared to a lot of other states. And that's a macro score uh, that's based on 10 different elements. A couple different ideas, though, about what are ways that you can extend that further uh, there's this one new reform that is uh, sort of uh, taking hold around the country right now called course access. Uh, and sort of course access is if you uh, had to create a virtual school today, it probably would not look like your South Carolina virtual school. It would not look like the Florida virtual school. These were sort of created at a day and period where there were not a ton of different course providers. You needed to essentially create an entity that could make courses and then release courses and help students enroll in those courses. Now all those costs have come down and there's a ton of different providers that are out there. And what's happening is that in states like Louisiana and Texas, they're shifting the role from the state being uh, or funding just one uh, a virtual school to essentially approving a portfolio of different online providers. Think of it almost like the Achievement School District, but where the state is approving a whole variety of different course providers, uh, sometimes online, sometimes face-to-face, -face, and sometimes blended, uh, and then giving students the right to take a certain number of those courses, so up to three courses. So what's amazing about, and then the other thing that happens with this is that there's a pay for performance funding system too. So students enroll in a course and the provider gets paid a certain base pay and then they get paid once a student completes the course. So back to Whitney's presentation, you're paying for outcomes. That's actually sort of a pay for completion. We think there's all sorts of ways to sort of work in other performance measures there too. So not just paying for a student completing a course, but actually ex exceeding uh, several different outcome measures as well. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. else. But do other states have minimal requirements that a student must take, or is it an allowance? Type? It's a total, at least in the, in the way we're seeing this play out in Texas and uh, Louisiana, it's an allowance. So a student doesn't need to take a course. Uh, if they don't want to, it's just really sort of an option that's given to them. Uh, the district has a chance to do some counseling to see if there's an option within the, the district, but often it's you get to pick from a different approved catalog of different approved courses and approved providers that the state has uh, put through a rigorous review system. What's nice about this, the, these bills are passing with huge support. Uh, when I say huge support, like Louisiana was the most controversial one and that passed in both chambers with more than 69% of the votes. Uh, voting favorably to it. Most states are passing in the high 70s. The reason is because this is sort of giving, it, it's, it's doing what uh, Apple iTunes did to music albums, right? Like now you just don't have to buy one album to get that one song. Uh, and often school choice is like sort of an album thing. You get this album or this album. Now all of a sudden students can literally create a playlist of different courses that best meet their needs. And, and if you think about it, that's the reality that most of us have experienced. We like our school, we don't like that one teacher. Right? Or we're not clicking with that one teacher. And if you think about that, that's really true with math. Right? How much I uh, struggled with math, it's not that we were stupid, it's just that we had one teacher that only knew how to describe the math concept this way. 
Now all of a sudden you can say, gosh, like I really want to learn calculus. I don't learn it well from Mr. Smith, but maybe I want to take a Khan Academy course. Maybe I want to take it from the Florida Virtual School. Maybe I want to take it from a university. Uh, and so again, it's giving different options at the course, uh, course level. And it's, uh, it's amazing what Louisiana has done. Again, huge commitment to quality. Uh, they had over 100 different providers apply. They only approved 42. Uh, and uh, they did it through a really rigorous four-step review process. Uh, and the type of providers are all over the place. It's uh, full-time virtual schools. Uh, it's uh, cyber charter schools. It's school districts, uh, which is a great sort of selling point for schools, that this is a chance to earn revenue, not just lose it. Uh, it was uh, the uh, LSU, uh, they had out-of-state providers, for-profit, non-profit, it was just a whole rich diverse. Uh, blended learning, face-to-face, -face. Uh, they had a welding course uh, that was face-to-face, -face, so uh, pretty, pretty, bold, um, pretty bold. And then quality control, huge commitment to quality control, which I think we've learned through other reforms in the past, you can't put enough emphasis on quality. So everything from the approval process to uh, how student reporting is done twice a month. Uh, there's a sort of an Amazon-like feedback system with stars that goes back into the course catalog, uh, as well as the tu tu tuition payment sort of being based again on completion. And then blended learning. We're going to talk about that for a little bit too, but this is sort of a new revolution that's sweeping uh, the education system and really want to sort of drill on wh what's the opportunity here, but also where is the opportunity from a public policy standpoint, because these are school models uh, that are very sort of difficult to mandate from a state level. But blended learning is really sort of three things. It's student learning, uh, at least in part in online, so some type of online learning with some type of face-to-face -face instruction uh, in a school building. Uh, to some degree. So kind of combining the best of face-to-face -face with the best of online learning, allowing them to go at their own pace. And what this does is it completely changes the school. So the school model on the left is the one that we're all used to. A teacher up in front of the classroom. Maybe the classroom looks a little bit different. Maybe the kids are in a circle and not in rows. But what happens in a blended learning classroom is that this really sophisticated technology starts uh, analyzing and assessing where each student is, literally on sort of micro standard levels, and then starts grouping them in the different types of activities. So you have some kids doing 101 activities, uh, you have some kids actually doing small group activities, and the teacher, uh, the reason teachers are loving this is because they're getting out of having to teach to the middle, and they're getting to work with the 10 kids that need the most help, or they're getting to work with that one kid that needs the most help on the concept. Everyone's progressing at their own pace, and that teacher, they're being more efficient and using resources more efficiently because they're being directed to the kids that need the most help. So what are, what are opportunities for South Carolina to help lead the nation here? Well, one, take online learning to the next level through course access. So think about ways of embracing course access. One easy way is to say we're going to have every single AP course offered for every single student here in the state, not just from one provider, but from different providers. Because again, we all sort of learn differently. And so what works well with one type of provider may not well work well with one kid with another provider. Uh, embrace high quality through the whole pay for success. So again, just don't, not just an approval system, but pay for the outcomes that you want to see in terms of successful student outcomes. Fund the model, not the technology. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes we think a lot of public policymakers make across the country is to think if we gave every single kid a laptop, the blended learning classroom I just showed you would happen. And it's not the case. You know, we, you, you, the way to make government more efficient isn't to necessarily give every, you know, every employee a new laptop, right? It's sort of reinventing the processes and redesigning the classroom. That happens at the local level. So it's making sure you're funding a model that the technology is supporting as opposed to just putting technology in and hoping that the model is created. Flexible funding, just because, again, the type of universe that we're, our students are entering right now, especially with course access, and especially with all these outside opportunities, we need more flexible funding model. Uh, we, we need uh, not just school choice programs, but programs that recognize that the choices are now taking place not just with schools, but down to the course level and even smaller in some ways. And then privacy, security, and trust. That this isn't a separate issue. This is a theme throughout anything that you're doing in digital technology. If you're not sort of uh, passing, as you're thinking about digital learning bills, you have to also think about the privacy, the security, and what are we doing to make sure we're preserving uh, the great trust that parents are giving us with this sensitive student data. Uh, and we have lots of suggestions on all these different things from model legislation. Uh, the only other thing is to be bold. There's a great T.S. Eliot quote, only those who risk going too far can possibly know how far one can go. So you have the chance to seize the mantle uh, and to get that A in the Digital Learning Now report card, but to literally lead the country uh, in the next revolution uh, of education. 
uh, we have resources, uh, and we also have our advocacy director here, Ryan, who could put you in touch with our experts as well as with our network of partners, the Christensen Institute, INACOL, and others uh, that, that work with us on all these issues. So thanks very much. Questions?